Welcome to MMA True Fan, a biographical podcast series on legendary mixed martial artists. In this episode on Kevin Randleman, hear exclusive interviews with Mark Coleman, Randy Couture, Elizabeth Randleman, Boss Rutten, and more. Please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. You gotta remember one thing about Kevin. Every person he ever came across, he treated like he was his best friend. And and that was Kevin. So it, you could have met him for 15 minutes and he made you feel like you were the most important person he'd ever met. That was the kind of person Kevin was. And, and I, I've never seen anything like it. You know, a lot of people always say that, oh, he gives shirt off your back, he does this and he does this, you know. With him, that's the real guy. It's not for attention, it's not for anything, it's just solely because he wants to help that person. There's nothing that he wants to gain from it. He's always trying to make whoever he can better, especially if they're competing. Uh, As a competitor and as a coach, probably the best motivator out there. If he's in your corner, you're going to perform at a level that you wouldn't normally perform at. As a man, he's very uplifting. MMA True Fan presents... Kevin Randleman, by Rich Donahue and Nate Evans. When a loved one passes, we sometimes ask ourselves, what is life worth? What is your legacy? Was your life what they wanted it to be? In May of 2016, MMAfighting.com published an article by Shaheen El Shadi titled, In the Shadow of the Monster. In it, El Shadi writes, a supernatural talent in a moment that trafficked in the fantastical ferocious, and humanly strong with once-in-a-generation athleticism. He can even drop a mic with the best of them. The man El Shadi was referring to was Kevin the Monster Randleman. Kevin Christopher Randleman was born on August 10, 1970, in Sandusky, Ohio, a small city on the shore of Lake Erie between Cleveland and Toledo with a population of approximately 25,000. Kevin grew up in a large family with very supportive parents. Kevin's mother worked at the Erie County Welfare Office and a social worker type position for many years before becoming a stay-at-home mom after Kevin's youngest brother, Jason, was born. Kevin's father worked at a steel company before transitioning to work as a cook when the steel industry went in decline. Kevin's parents were always very supportive and active in everything Kevin and his siblings did. Kevin's father was a coach for all of his and his brother's sports teams and was always a positive role model. Even though Kevin came from a loving and supportive family, they weren't well off financially. Raising such a large family has its obvious upsides, as well as its financial challenges. Any financial challenges Kevin's family faced never hindered their morale, though. Kevin's sister, Erica Randleman, shares some of her earliest memories of her brother, who was just one year younger than her. This was so cute. He had the best smile. You know, when he smiled, it's like his whole face just lit up. But he was just so energetic. He wanted to know about everything. He wanted to do everything. And it seemed like everything he touched, he just was good at it, you know. So he was such a natural. So I can only imagine that comes from mom and dad. Kevin kept himself busy outside of athletics as well. Clip courtesy of MMA inside the cage. Um, just like a lot of people, I, I'm one of 11 kids. I got a lot of family members. We weren't rich. We were actually, you know, kind of like, I mean, we were poor. So... Didn't have a lot of money, and my only way to get out was to go to college. I always fought in the streets, you know, being a kid. And I mean, I don't want to say I was ghetto or anything like that, but, you know, when you don't have money, you fight. You, you learn how to do a lot of things. Kevin faced many challenges from other kids in the neighborhood for one reason or another, whether it was because people wanted to challenge him or pick on someone he cared about. Kevin was going to let someone he cared about get victimized, and he had no problem taking a stand on their behalf. And uh, I hate bullies. You know, I don't care who you are, what it is. You know, I'm, I'm against bullies 110%. I don't care where I'm at. If I see someone bullying someone just because they think that they're better, I'm going to go off on them. That's how I am. I think a lot of times people were a little envious of him. He was just such a cute little kid, such a tough little kid. He was good at what he did, and I think some of that um, triggered some of his fights sometimes as a kid. Definitely was a protector, so he wasn't going to let sit stand back and watch somebody get bullied if he was capable of stepping in. It just it, she just wasn't that person. As Kevin grew older, his athletic gifts began to stand out more and more. He attended Sandusky High School, where he started all four years in the football team and ran track, where he qualified for the state finals. But there's one sport that stood out for him among others. 
I really think that when she got that wrestling bug, it was over. It was just amazing how much of a natural he was. But I think it started, my older brother, Troy, started wrestling when he was in um, junior high school. And I think that's what triggered Kevin to want to try it, too. Not that, not that he wouldn't have done so anyways, but I think he was trying to kind of do what his big brother was doing. And um, he just took it and he just was amazing. He just ran with it. As a wrestler, Kevin won the state championship in 1989 while amassing a 122-11 record over his high school career. Kevin was initially eyeing a football scholarship from Toledo when he met one of the people who would help change his life. This person was legendary Ohio State wrestling coach Russ Hellickson. He was dynamic and explosive and scored a lot of points. And you know, He was really a talented guy. He had a lot of native ability. He was almost freakish. Russ knew right away that Kevin was someone special. With a sub-4-3 40-yard dash time, and a 38-inch vertical, Kevin's measurables were unbelievable. Kevin immediately found someone he admired in Russ. Russ's warm demeanor and wrestling intelligence were a perfect combination for fostering Kevin's development both as an athlete and a young man. They had a little slogan between one another where they'd say, Keep on believing. That epitomized their relationship as one of inspiration and hope. It was something they'd say when they'd see each other years later as well, long after Kevin left Ohio State. Russ gives credit to one of his assistant coaches at the time for helping develop Kevin as a wrestler, UFC Hall of Famer and former collegiate national champion Mark the Hammer Coleman. Mark had won the national championship for Ohio State a couple of years earlier and was now looking to train for the 1992 Olympics in Barcelona. Mark didn't recruit Kevin and didn't even really talk to him for the first few months of his first year as a redshirt. A redshirt is an athlete who withdraws from competition so they can develop their skills further and extend their eligibility another year. Mark worked primarily with the heavier wrestlers on the team, and Kevin's weight at the time was just below Mark's group. Mark shared with us that Kevin didn't feel that Mark even liked him at first. Not for any particular reason, but just from a general feeling that Kevin had. Kevin even commented to his friends that he could see himself having problems with Mark down the road. But one day, in the weight room, Mark was looking for a lifting partner, and Kevin happened to be there. You know, I looked at Kevin, and he walked by, and I said, Hey, dude, I said, do you want to work out with me today? And uh, old Kevin Randleman, and he looked at me and said, hell yeah. And then I tell you what, me and Kevin went through one hell of a weight training session that day. It was awesome. Not only did Kevin have tremendous national talent, he had the work ethic and determination to achieve great things. He had the qualities that a coach looks for in an athlete. Mark gave Kevin some pretty lofty goals after his redshirt year. He knew what Kevin had to do to become great, and he didn't mince words about it. Kevin was up for the challenge. I said, when I see you in three months, I expect to see you 20 pounds bigger and squat 500 pounds. So I had hopes of that. And when he came back, his redshirt freshman year for the first day of practice, all the guys gave him a pretty good work, you know, pretty good time. No. He moved those guys out of the way real quick. Kevin shattered expectations during his first year of competition, winning 42 matches in a row on his way to becoming the first African-American wrestler to earn All-American status at THE Ohio State University. After winning the Big Ten tournament and advancing through nationals, Kevin met a familiar face in the finals, Iowa University's Mark Ryland. Kevin and Mark had faced each other twice that season prior to their national championship match, with Mark winning during the season and Kevin winning during the Big Ten tournament. While it was a competitive match, Ryland frustrated Kevin by stopping his single leg takedown attempts again and again. Kevin's frustrations culminated in him trying for a double leg takedown. Ryland caught Kevin in a neck wrench and pinned him. This loss embarrassed and angered Kevin. This was when collegiate wrestling highlights were first appearing on ESPN and other national outlets. Seeing himself get pinned on television fueled Kevin's desire to become better and ensure he didn't meet the same fate the following year. Kevin and Mark became roommates and training partners. They were determined to win the national championship, and they could soon themselves with the training and conditioning. I never took it easy on him. I pushed him and beat him as bad as I could. And when practice was over, we shook hands, and then we went back to the house, and we ate, and then we played John Madden, the original John Madden football. That was as intense as... uh, the national championships were. 
We put a lot of holes in the wall playing John Madden, me and Randall. <laughs> Kevin's sophomore year was even more impressive than the year before. He dominated the competition. It finished his 1992 season with a staggering 42-0-3 record. Kevin's former teammate, longtime close friend, and fellow mixed martial artist, Eric Smith, describes his former mentor that season. And he just... He was on a mission. Mark had him in that gym every day. That's all they really cared about is, is him getting stronger, stronger, stronger. From there, his double got more powerful. And then uh, he had a really good step around throw. That was probably the year he worked the hardest. And I think he went with like 42-0-3 that year. He had three ties against this big foot dude named Lenny Green, who just used to give him problems. But besides that, he destroyed everybody else and he pinned to the national finals that year. Kevin arrived at an interesting time for African-Americans in the wrestling world. Lloyd Butch Keezer became the first African-American to become an Olympic medalist when he won the silver medal in Montreal just 15 years prior in 1976. Was wrestling a white man's sport during that time? Not necessarily, though it was generally dominated by regional club teams throughout the off-season. These clubs usually gathered the best trainers and talent, but could be quite expensive, so there are socioeconomic implications for whom could and could not access the best opportunities. Racism reared its ugly head on occasion as well. Kevin experienced isolated instances of racism on multiple occasions, as Eric Smith explains. There was a cop that once put a gun in his mouth that was back in Sandusky, and that happened there. There was a time where we left the bar on down High Street. There used to be a whole bunch of bars right on High Street, and Kevin got maced for no reason. I think they were just spraying mace, and he whipped around, and I guess when he whipped around, he accidentally hit a cop, and they threw him in the paddy wagon for that. That was kind of like... That was a little racially charged just because it's a different time back then. You got to remember, this is like, remember the OJ documentary that just came out? That was that and then Rodney King, and that was big on our campus at that time. Kevin still had plenty of fun with the people closest to him, though. Eric, Mark, Kevin, and their late friend, Ray Mendoza, spent many memorable nights at Kevin and Mark's apartment, playing video games, having impromptu wrestling matches, crashing through the walls, and basically destroying everything in sight. There were times when Kevin liked to have fun at other people's expense as well. Mark shares a story about one of the many phone conversations he heard between Kevin and Russ. Kevin liked to be secretive and sneaky a little bit sometimes. And, uh, okay, so I'm at home with Kevin, and he's telling me he's fine. He's going to wrestle tomorrow in the big match. But then Russ helps, and <laughs> Russ would call Kevin many times. And I would sit there and listen to Kevin. We'd pause the Madden football game, and I would listen to Kevin tell Russ he doesn't think he's going to be able to wrestle the next day because his his knee or what have you was uh, pretty banged up, injured. <laughs> you know, and I would just look at Kevin, and he would look at me and give me a big wink and a smile, and I would say, what the heck? Because he loved to play games with Russ Hawks. And, and they, they would hang up. I said, Kevin, he said, oh, I'm good. I'm fine. I said, I'm just playing with Russ. I go, I said, Kevin, Russ isn't going to get any sleep tonight because we need you tomorrow. He loved to play games with a lot of people. But he loved fucking with Russ. Kevin also liked to play jokes on other people as well. He even told people he was a year younger than he really was. When his sister Erica asked him why he did it, he told her he liked the idea of people thinking that. Aside from these jokes, Kevin was all business when it came time for competition. It was during the following season, when Kevin was pursuing his second straight national championship, where one of the defining moments of Kevin's collegiate career took place, the jaw incident, as told by Russ Ellickson. Uh, Rex Holman and Kevin were national champs together, and they were wrestling in practice, and Kevin lifted Rex from behind and in the flurry, Rex fell on Kevin's side of his, of his face on the mat, and you know, everything just stopped, and he, he had dislocated both of his, you know, at, at, at the joint, of the jaw on each side of his face. Uh, you know, it was actually protruding out, and they got him into the training room, and they took him to the uh, university hospital. It took him I think uh, well over an hour to get it reduced back into place. And uh, at the time, uh, you know, the, the, the doctor said that, you know, he was going to be out of competition. Well, we're, you know, we're a week away from, from the national tournament. Uh, you know, we had finished up the Big Ten and, you know, in the middle of practice. 
you know, they said, well, you're not going to be able to let him wrestle because he, there's a chance that he could dislocate it again, he could injure a nerve. And, and I said, well, that, that's not my decision to make. I said, he, you know, he's a defending national champion because, you know, he said even at the time when the doctor was telling him he couldn't compete anymore, uh, you know, he's kind of mumbling through uh, his lips because his, you know, his jaws are swollen. And he said, they're not going to stop me, coach. They're not going to stop me. And I said, Kevin, just relax. He said, you know, we'll leave it up to you. It'll be your decision. And, you know, he elected to go, obviously. He's, you know, he knew it was going to be his last year, and he wanted to do it. When we, I think we were in the, whether it was the quarterfinal or the semifinal match, I, I can't really remember. But uh, in the middle of action, he dislocated one side of his jaw again. And we took the injury time. We had our trainer out there, and they even had a doctor trying to get his hand in there to get it back into place. And the uh, referee came over and said that, you know, your injury time is almost out. You have 15 seconds. And nobody was re- able to, you know, get it fixed. And Kevin pushed everybody away, and he dropped from his feet down to the mat and literally bounced his side of his head off of the mat, and it went back into place. He finished that match, and he, you know, he got into the finals, and we had a guy who had a front headlock which would obviously have made it a very painful thing. But Kevin kept his chin pulled down to his jaw and did a lot of great wrestling in uh, winning that national championship. So, you know, he, he was committed to being a national champ. And, you know, that to me was a, a reflection of what Kevin was willing to do to see through the dream that he always had for wrestling. And he was a tough guy. You know, he was able to endure a lot of pain, put up a lot of things, but it was a good a good story ending for a guy who was totally committed to see the, the battle out. And he, and he did. Mark Coleman also remembers the moment Kevin's jaw popped out that last time very clearly. And then he looks at me and says, pop my effing jaw back into place. And uh, honestly, well, that was a bit too much for me. You know what I mean? I, I was like, damn, you know, that, that's too much to ask, Kev. I don't even know nothing about jaws. But he's looking at me saying, come on, you know, hit me. He's telling me to hit him in the face, hit his jaw back into place. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, you know, I'm crazy, but I'm not this crazy. So anyways, so he, yeah, he dropped down to the mat, slammed his head on the ground a couple of times, stood back up, and he looked at me, and he looked at Russ, and he said, I'm ready to go. I'm good. Kevin had become a fan favorite during his time at Ohio State. By the time he got to the finals for a second national championship, his popularity had grown. The whole crowd, 20,000 fans of the NC2A finals were watching him because Everybody knew Kevin Raman, and that's not normal in wrestling. Because when he ran out to the center of the wrestling mat, and he jumped three times, and the whole crowd counts to three with him, well, if I was the opponent, it might have kind of made me shrivel my nuts up a little bit. After winning his second national championship, Kevin faced a confluence of issues demands of being a father to his young son Calvin, eligibility issues, and other problems prevented Kevin from competing his senior year. Once Kevin's college career ended, he found himself back in Sandusky, managing a new gym and caring for his family. Kevin was busy and content, but then he received a phone call from an old friend that would change his life. You know, I'm not a big guy, and in college I was 5'8", wrestling 170, so I wasn't a big guy fighting, and I was fighting guys that were big 260. So Mark Coleman saw how re- how relentless and how aggressive I was and how much I could fight. And he, when he became the UFC champ, everyone always asked you if you have anyone that you train with. So the first thing in his mind was like, yeah, Kevin Randleman. I was dead. And at the time, I had a son. And um, uh, I wanted to go home. I wanted to raise him. I wanted to be with him. I wanted to spend more time with him. So we were open. We had a gym, and I was managing the gym back in Ohio. And uh, Coleman called me and said, hey, you want to fight? I said, no, nah, man. I'm like, I'm cool. I'm right here with my son. I'm watching WWE. And uh, he said, $30,000 if you win. I said, who do I got to kill? He said, you just got to win three matches in one night. And I said, what do I got to do? He said, there's a ticket for you at the Cleveland airport. Your fight's in 28 days. I flew to Arizona. I trained with Mark Coleman and Mark Kerr. Went to, went to Brazil, fought a, fought a brawl in which they, we didn't wear gloves. This is when it was real. 
Kevin soon found himself in a world most people had never seen, a world that is hard to believe ever existed, even for the most hardened fans of combat sports, the world of Brazilian Valley Tudo. Eric Smith made the trip to Brazil multiple times with Kevin and describes the scene. You know, they're all cheering in Portuguese and it's, you know, you don't know if they're being mean, but it's coming across real mean. It's just a crazy setting. It was just how close the fans were, how fast if you fell out the ring, they threw you back in the ring. And one thing about the Brazilians is they, they I mean, they come to fight. This was true no holds barred fighting or moves that aren't allowed in any major organization today, like eye gouges, groin strikes, fish hooks, and small joint manipulation are all in play. Kevin's graphic depictions of these events paint a world of extreme violence and brutality. Clip courtesy of MMA Roasted. Uh, when I was in Brazil, one of the guys, oh, he tried to bend my finger back. I broke, I break both of my thumbs because of every time I feel a punch or whatever, I broke both my thumbs <laughs> and the guy pulled my finger. So I took my finger and put it in his cut and tried to rip it open. This is shocking behavior. How can a man known for being generous to strangers and endearing to children be the same man who's digging his fingers into wounds to rip them open? The answer is simple. This was prize fighting, with enough money at stake to change the quality of life for his family. It was an opportunity of a lifetime. Kevin's mixed martial arts career began in an organization called Universal Valley Tudo Fighting, which we will refer to here as UVTF. These were tournament-style events, similar to early UFC shows. Randleman dominated his debut at UVTF3, winning three times in one night. In the finals, he beat Dan Bobish by a submission due to punches. While the world of Brazilian Valley Tudo may have seemed barbaric and gruesome to some, it provided Kevin and Mark with the opportunity to earn a significant amount of money for their families. It also helped fill a competitive void left in them. To Mark, it seemed too good to be true. You just win three fights in one night, and the cops aren't coming. Fans are screaming, and you're going to get a paycheck. This was perfect. At UVTF6, he defeated Ebenezer Fontes Braga and Mario Neto before suffering his first loss at the final to Carlos Bejeta. Renneman believed there were some shady circumstances prior to this fight as he fought two other Brazilians who dragged the matches out by escaping the rank and hitting him from the outside. But Mark and Kevin found Bajeto to be a gentleman and a true professional afterward. He went out there against Bajeto, and uh, holy shit, you talk about a big old monster. And Random and had so many injuries, he couldn't even see. I hate to admit it, but so what? You can't win them all, motherfucker. We can't win them all. Carlos Bajeto... Classy guy. Class act. Yes, you got my guy. You know, you got him, but before he even got to you, he was half, you know, sliced up. He went on to fight in the Brazil Open 97, losing the finals to Tom Erickson. Overall, Kevin fought eight times in 1997, compiling a 6-2 and two record in three separate tournament-style events. Kevin made his debut in the Ultimate Fighting Championship in March of 1999 with the unanimous decision win over legendary kickboxer and MMA star Maurice Smith. Smith had defeated Coleman in the UFC less than two years prior and also held a win over the legendary Tank Abbott. Kevin had been known for being loud and jumping around before fights, but he had realized that it would be best for him to try to not waste energy before a fight, as Eric Smith observed. That was one of the times I've seen him the most calm ever, and he just destroyed Maurice Smith. He was just calm in there, nothing crazy, no screaming. By most accounts, it was his win over Smith that first put him on the map globally. Kevin's next fight was for the UFC Heavyweight Championship against a man who had gone unbeaten in his last 20 fights while dominating the Japanese fighting world. Three-time King of Pancras, Boss Rudin. This was during a time when most fights were a clash of two different styles, and this was a classic showdown between a top grappler versus a top striker. Boss and Kevin had an awkwardly close encounter alone on an elevator the night before the fight. Boss explains a deal Kevin proposed that actually turned out to be a ploy. He said, well, if you keep your feet on the ground, I, I promise you I won't take you down. And I go, what is it? Does he mean like with uh, no kicking? And I go, oh, yeah, thank you. So then in the fight, and that was a smart thing from him, he slapped his thigh. That was the first thing he did, like, kick me here. So now I thought, what the heck? He just said, if I don't kick, you know? So that's when I came up with that thing. Oh, I make it into a roundhouse kick. Uh, I, I act like I give him a low kick, but I, I turn it into a front kick. So if he shoots, I'm going to kick him right in the face. I got him take him down. But then he told me later that was a complete setup because as soon as I did that, he moved backwards 
And then my whole game plan went out the window there because I go, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. He's moving back on kicks. Oh, so I can kick. And then right away I kick. And of course, immediately he took me down. So yeah, as, as, that was a, his strategy. So I would say his strategy to, to get me out of that, uh, to, to make me kick a certain way, that was very smart done. Kevin and Boss spent most of their fight on the ground in what was mostly back and forth action. With Kevin on top of Boss, pounding him with hammer strikes and punches while Boss landed elbows to the top of Kevin's head. Kevin broke Boss's nose early on and cut him below his right eye shortly thereafter. Boss was bleeding throughout most of the fight, and Mark wasn't subtle about what he thought Kevin should do with that blood, as Kevin explains. Put it in his eyes, random it. Blind him with the blood. Smear it in his face. Stick your finger in the cut. Pull it. Kevin lost a controversial split decision against Boss that is still debated today. Following the Rootin' fight, Kevin went on to become the UFC heavyweight champion by defeating Pete Williams. This was after Rutten vacated the belt and opted for retirement. Williams had recently knocked out Mark Coleman with a legendary highlight reel head kick the previous year, so this victory was a significant redemption for Mark and Kevin's team Hammerhouse. Kevin's first title defense was against one of the most feared strikers on the planet, Brazilian sensation Pedro Hizo. Randleman defeated Hizo in what was one of the most significant wins of his career. Kevin's second title defense? was against UFC Hall of Famer Randy the Natural Couture at UFC 28. Randy was a decorated wrestler at Oklahoma State University, while Kevin was at Ohio State. The two men were well aware of each other's wrestling pedigrees. Randy knew he had a fight on his hands. Obviously had great takedowns, explosive double leg, tough to get out from underneath him once he took you down. And that's how he won a lot of his fights was his ability to take guys down and, and smother them, stay on top of them and, and pound away on them. So I knew that would be the challenge when I faced him, was who's going to get those takedowns and who's going to be able to survive those situations. Randy knew he had to be ready for the possibility of being taken down and prepared for that scenario accordingly. I had spent a ton of time working on, on the possibility that, that Kevin would take me down, and, and then what? Uh, so I spent a lot of time on my back working on the jiu-jitsu and, and the guard and, and being able to be effective not only to protect myself from there, but to possibly be offensive and, uh, from, from that bottom position, which is a, not a place most wrestlers like to be. Kevin took Randy down the first two rounds, but Randy was able to mitigate the damage and survive. In the third, Randy was able to take Kevin down, and from there went on to win by a TKO near the end of the round. Following the loss to Couture, Kevin moved down to light heavyweight to face another future Hall of Famer in Chuck Liddell at UFC 31. Kevin lost to Chuck by knockout in the first round. Kevin thought the fight was stopped too early, but looking back, John McCarthy made the right call. Kevin's next fight was against a dangerous opponent in Ronaldo Babalu Sabral. An unexpected series of events played into this match, as his former Hammerhouse teammate and friend Wes Sims explains. Kevin was so sick that he weighed, I think he was down to 188, and they had to put IVs in him. And he said, I'm going to fight. Mark Coleman had interesting insight on this fight as well. Randleman actually gave Sorbro the triangle choke. He gave it to him like six times during this fight. He let him lock it up because he knew he was strong enough to not get choked out. And he was buying time, killing the clock. Nobody understands how amazing this is. He should have got choked out, but somehow he didn't. Because he's Kevin fucking Randleman. Even though he was sick as a dog, so sick that he lost control of his bowels and had an accident in his shorts during the fight, Kevin found a way to beat a world-class fighter in Sabral. This is a story his friends still joke about, and something Kevin wasn't overly embarrassed about. It was a situation where Kevin wasn't well enough to fight, but found a way to get out there and compete. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be the last time Kevin would force himself out there when he wasn't healthy. Following a 20-second knockout win for Brian Foster at RFC 1, Kevin began competing in the organization where some of his most legendary moments took place, the Pride Fighting Championships in Japan. Mark Coleman was a well-established fighter in Pride, having been the winner of the 2000 Open Weight Grand Prix. Kevin had made the trip to Japan with him several times. Kevin won his first fight in Pride in September 2002 with a win over Michio Yoshi Ohara with a unanimous decision. Less than two months later, he defeated Kenichi Yamamoto with a third round TKO after delivering crushing knees while on top in the north-south position. Kevin's next fight came less than a month later against another fighter who was making a name for himself in the organization, 
Marulo Ninja Hua of Brazil. Ninja had put together impressive wins over Daju Matsui, as well as former Abu Dhabi champion and Jiu-Jitsu master Mario Sperry. Both Kevin and Ninja were on the rise and close to being in title contention. This fight had a lot riding on it. You knew right away that this fight was going to have all the makings of a classic. Both were explosive, high-energy fighters who were known for being aggressive in the ring. After two rounds of grueling back-and-forth action, Kevin landed a crushing left hook to start the third round to Ninja's already swollen right eye. Ninja immediately showed the effects and struggled as he continued until the referee stopped the action to have his eye checked, which resulted in the fight ending and Kevin winning by Dr. Stoppage. Kevin ended 2002 with great enthusiasm. He shrugged off the losses to Kator and Liddell and won five fights in a row that year. Kevin's personality was a big hit with the Japanese fans as well. His larger-than-life aura, combined with his athleticism and physique, made him a perfect fit for another passion of his that was also popular in Japan, professional wrestling. Kevin and Mark were tag team partners for a while. Mark shares his memories. It was just an easy fit. I was already doing pro wrestling. And then the next thing you know, Pride started their own organization, Hustle Hustle. And then, uh, yeah, there it was. It just fell into place. And me and Kevin are going to be the American tag team. We got wrestling singers on, wrestling shoes on, and we're going to whoop your ass. We got in there. And I would stand in the middle of the ring, and he would get behind me. I would stand real firm and bend my knees a little bit, but this guy would run and jump and just touch my shoulders and do the splits and jump over top me and land right in front of me and then kneel down, and then we would hit our pose. (laughs) What the fuck? It was, you know, he was was just a Super freak, spectacular. You know, he just really was. Kevin's mentality and give-it-your-all attitude was just what the professional wrestling promoters were looking for. Mark shares with us the time when he first took Kevin to meet them. And I remember him being on the top rope, and he was doing a flying elbow off the top rope. You know, not an easy move. Well, they had him halfway across the ring when he started, and he kept bringing the guy back about a foot, a foot, a foot. And he kept asking Kevin if he could jump this far. He said, yeah. Next thing you know, the guy's pretty much on the other side of the ring. And Kevin Random is flying through the air in practice, you know, landing a perfect elbow drop to a guy's chest. <laughs> Anyways, so we go back to the hotel room that night. We're laying there, and Kevin's like, oh, man. He goes, I don't feel so good. I go, what are you talking about? What's up, buddy? He said, oh, man, my whole leg hurts, my whole hip. It's just real sore right here. I don't know why. I go, what do you mean you don't know why, Kevin? I said, you jumped off the top rope ten times for nothing. I said, save your jumps off the top rope for when they're paying you. While Kevin's ambition and desire to please was a dream come true for the promoters, it was his eye for showmanship and flair that separated him and Mark from many others. Kevin's success in pride in professional wrestling made him wildly popular with the Japanese fans, and Kevin relished in it. He always made time to give the fans what they wanted, and an old friend, Randy Couture, got to see one of his memorable interactions firsthand. Japan's an interesting place, and the fans find out right away what hotels we're staying at, and and they literally camp in, in the lobbies to get pictures and autographs, and Kevin was just one of those guys that they loved uh, and just would mob him. And he was very gracious and took his time and, you know, would even slap them, <laughs> uh, which sounds weird, but that, that's what they want. They're somehow uh, enamored with the size of our hands and, and generally, I think, just because we're much larger than, than most of the people in that population. So they, they kind of want that. You know, they, they ask you if you'll, if you'll slap them, which is kind of strange. Um, but I saw him line up six of them and just walk down the line. Kevin didn't know it yet but he was about to go through what was possibly the most turbulent time of both his career and personal life. His next fight was against another rising star in the Pride organization, Quinn Rampage Jackson. This fight was billed as a challenge match to champion Vanderlei Silva. This was Kevin's opportunity to get that coveted title shot he'd been seeking since his loss to Randy Couture two and a half years earlier. But the result was not what Kevin had hoped. After some back and forth action, Jackson landed a combination that put Kevin down. Jackson finished the fight a few seconds later by knockout. Kevin later said his fight against Jackson 
It was the only time he had been knocked unconscious in his career. While this was a tough loss, Kevin took it in stride, even going into Jackson's locker room after the fight to congratulate him and wish him the best in his upcoming title fight against Vanilla Silva. Kevin's next fight found him going against Japanese sensation Kazushi Sakuraba. Sakuraba is not only known for being an outstanding wrestler, but practiced catch wrestling, a form of submission fighting. So this was also a clash of different types of wrestling styles. Kevin went for the takedown pretty early on in the fight, and Sakuraba shows him good defense for a moment, but then Kevin had him down. Once on the ground, the chess match for wrist control and leverage was evident, with Sakuraba finding a way off his back and pushing for better positioning. This fight went back and forth, with both fighters showing great action and technique. But in the end, Sakuraba found the armbar and submitted Kevin late in the third and final round. Following the loss of Sakuraba, Kevin found himself at a crossroads. He had just lost two in a row. The last time he lost two in a row was in the UFC. He seemed to have run out of top guys to fight there, so he went to Pride, and now he found himself in mostly the same position. Shortly after his fight with Sakuraba, Kevin met another person who would change his life, his future wife and love of his life, Elizabeth. Kevin and Elizabeth met through a mutual friend, former UFC heavyweight champion Rico Rodriguez. Here, Rico describes his longtime friend. All eyes were on her whether you wanted to or not. She just attracted that type of potential. She was, you know, still was dropped to gorgeous. Very outgoing, very captivating when she, she takes the center of the room. And, you know, she's always dressed in, you know, this unbelievable upper demand suits, you know, just really high-end corporate America. Like Kevin, Elizabeth was known for her earnestness, candidness, and generosity while being able to play hardball when necessary. By all accounts, Kevin went crazy over Elizabeth the moment he saw her. He even told Rico Rodriguez he was going to marry Elizabeth a few minutes after meeting her. As for Elizabeth, well, she wasn't blown over so quickly. She wasn't starstruck by Kevin. Not because she didn't know who he was. She knew exactly who he was. But she wasn't the type to fall into things. He wanted to make that clear to her as soon as possible. He said something to me, not that night, but like a day or two later. And it sounded like he was so full of shit, but I knew he wasn't. Like there was just something about his delivery that was so genuine that I remember pulling away from Rico's house going, that guy is either the biggest fucking smoothest bullshitter I've ever met <laughs> or, or that has to be true. And he was like, because he grabbed my hand, and he was like, no, you don't understand, Elizabeth. I've been looking for you my whole life. Elizabeth was moved by Kevin's sincerity, but he said this after meeting her once. What's she supposed to think? Elizabeth wasn't the only person he needed to convince before they could begin a relationship. He was still married to his first wife, Barbara. Kevin and Barbara were college sweethearts and married in 2000, but after repeated hardships, their marriage had soured long before he had met Elizabeth in 2004. Kevin had asked Barbara for a divorce prior to meeting Elizabeth, but they were still married because, according to Elizabeth, she had refused to sign the papers. Elizabeth shared that Kevin and Barbara had an agreement that if Kevin fulfilled a longtime promise to take Barbara to Las Vegas, she would sign the papers. Kevin was going to Las Vegas to corner Wes Sims for Wes's second fight with Frank Mir, so he brought Barbara along with him to finish the deal. Kevin took Barbara over to Rico's house. Elizabeth was there. I remember him walking in with her, and I was like, oh, what a fucking dog. Like, just typical fucking dude. Like, you've yeah. been macking on me all week, and now you're in here with your wife. And I knew he was married, and he told me that he'd been trying to get a divorce. But when she walked into Rico's house, I remember being like, typical fighter. This is why I don't mess around with fighters, because they are athletes in general, because this is what they do, right? I remember leaving, and he comes outside, and he says, please don't think I'm a dog. And I said, oh, the guy that just asked to kiss me a couple hours ago who walked in with his wife? Nah, Mr. Randleman, why would I think you were a dog? And I got in my expedition, and he grabbed my hand. He said, I've been trying to get away from this woman for years. She's only here because she promised to sign the divorce papers. And now I'm looking at him, and I can't hear anything he says, but blah, 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 blah. If you would have asked me at that moment and told me that I was going to marry and have a kid with Kevin Randleman, I would have told you, you smoking crack, because I thought he was nothing but a typical fighter player at that moment. You know what I mean? Kevin was telling Elizabeth he wanted to marry her with his current wife nearby. He even told Elizabeth that Barbara was crazy, and he never really loved her, which didn't impress Elizabeth in the least. He even had Barbara take a picture of Kevin and Elizabeth together at the restaurant. It was a bizarre situation. Elizabeth was confused and turned off by the whole thing. Kevin, on the other hand, was a hopeless romantic. He wanted things to work out with Barbara. He was an idealist who may have jumped into things faster than he should, such as telling Elizabeth he wanted to marry her two days after meeting her. 
A couple weeks after meeting Elizabeth, Kevin agreed to terms for his first fight with Mirko Krokop. Kevin was looking for sponsorship, and Elizabeth helped him find it. It was during this time, February of 2004, when their relationship first began. Falling in love can be one of the most exciting times in a person's life. Meeting Elizabeth fulfilled everything Kevin had wanted. He was with the love of his life and someone who wasn't one to jump into things, so he knew her commitment to him was strong. But Kevin had a little time to enjoy it. His next opponent, Merkel Krokop, was one of the most feared fighters in the world at the time, and Kevin was a heavy underdog in their fight. Krokop had delivered brutal knockouts just prior to their fight against opponents Dos Karas Jr. and the legendary striker Igor Vobchanchin. Krokop's only loss in the sport up until that point was against Antonio Rodrigo Noguera in what was a legendary come-from-behind win for Noguera. Not many people gave Kevin a good chance in the fight. Even though Kevin was an incredible wrestler, Krokop's takedown defense was probably the best in the sport at the time, and almost no one thought Kevin could win a striking match with him. However, George Pardos, a U.S. Marine and former teammate of Kevin's at Ohio State, recalls one of his greatest weapons. Kevin had this outside single. He would shoot... He would grab the knee. 95% of the time, he would just beat you like you would not believe. Kevin's quickness and his speed were perceived to be his biggest weapon in this fight, along with his takedown ability. Previous opponents, like the aforementioned Boss Rutten and Randy Couture, had explained how difficult it was to get out from under Kevin once he is on top of you. Krokop's most dangerous weapon, his left high kick, was also very fast. His attacks were infamously known as right kick hospital, left kick cemetery. One high kick from Krokop would likely knock Kevin out, so their game plan going into it became clear. Wes Sims explains. He was knocking everybody out with an head kick. So, time it. As soon as he goes to throw it, step in. Blast him. Yeah. Bam, he still didn't nail him with a left hook. Kevin had enlisted the help of an old opponent and friend, Chuck Liddell. Liddell was one of the best strikers of his era, and someone who could help Kevin learn about the finer things in the striking game. Kevin shares some of that advice. He showed me stances. He showed me the preparation, like when a guy goes to throw a kick, that all the little tails that they give. How to attack the guy that's throwing the kick. If a guy's throwing a kick and he's trying to kick me with his right leg, attack his left shoulder, push him off balance. He's going to hit you, but it's just not going to be the powerful hit that he would get if you wouldn't push the shoulder. So finally, the day of the fight, I said, well, Chuck, can I just throw a hook and hit him? He's like, that's it. That's exactly what you should do. This fight had all the makings of a classic striker versus grappler on paper. But in reality, this fight was about timing. Can Kevin hit Krokop before getting knocked out? During the fight, Kevin went for a couple of half-hearted takedowns as he moved around the ring. There was a feeling that Kevin was going less than full speed, with the intention of going full speed and catching him off guard. Kind of like how a pitcher picks off a runner by doing a few half-speed pickup moves, and then getting the runner out of full speed. But this wasn't Kevin's game plan. About 90 seconds into the fight, Krokop stepped in to engage. Then, the unthinkable happened. Kevin landed a crushing left hook to Krokop's jaw, dropping him to the mat. Kevin quickly got on top of him. A few seconds later, Kevin landed heavy hammer strikes to Krokop's face, knocking him out cold. Kevin didn't even know what to do immediately afterward. And when the fight was over, I was just standing there walking around the ring like, damn, I can't fucking move. Wow, that was fucking easy. <laughs> you know, I, that's exactly what I was saying to myself. And Chuck jumped in the ring and was like, what the fuck are you doing? I'm like, I, I don't know. I, it kind of shocked me. I said, I don't know. What's the matter? Why aren't you going crazy? I said, I, I don't know. Why the fuck go crazy? Yeah, <laughs> 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 the ring ropes and Mark Coleman and, and Chuck and them were in the ring go crazy. The reactions on people's faces immediately following the fight, particularly Liddell when he first hugged Kevin, showed the shock and awe of the situation. Kevin had stunned the world. He had defeated one of the most feared strikers in the history of the sport at the top of his game. Not with the wrestling he was known for, but with a standing punch. Some argued it was a fluke, but in reality, this knockout was planned, calculated, and executed to perfection. Kevin was at one of the highest points in his career and personal life. He and Elizabeth were in love. His success and pride had helped given him celebrity status in Japan. Fans all over the world were talking about a shocking winner for Krokop. He was riding a wave of popularity that even he never experienced. Kevin's next fight would be against pride heavyweight champion Fedor Emelianenko. Emelianenko was wildly regarded as the best fighter in the world at the time, and is still considered to be one of the best fighters in the history of the sport. But just as Kevin was riding this high, tragedy struck. Kevin's father passed away two weeks before his fight against Fedor. Many were skeptical if Kevin was even going to be able to compete after such a traumatic event in his life. His sister Erica recalls how Kevin felt upon hearing the news. He was extremely sad. You know how when people pass away, you wish you spent more time. Like maybe you could have had more time back. 
So it was tough for him when we were at the funeral and stuff. I remember all that um, and trying to be supportive to mom under the circumstances and stuff like that. I'm um, getting past that. And then you have to kind of shut it down and, and move forward and, and start focusing back on training for this fight. So I'm not even sure if he was able to fully grieve the way he probably needed to under that circumstance, you know. Tragic losses like these can cause a person to question everything they've done in life. That type of guilt can haunt a person and weigh heavily on their psyche. Kevin was a professional, though, and fighting a man like Fader was an opportunity of a lifetime, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the sacrifice. The tone during introductions for this fight was eerily somber. Kevin stood across from Fedor with his hands together below his waist. Fedor, who was known for being calm before fights, was even more subdued than usual. The weight of Kevin's loss seemed to hang over the whole arena before what was about to be one of the most memorable fights in the sport's history. Kevin engaged with Fedor right away and took him down. Fedor used his grappling background as a former Sambo world champion to escape and get back to his feet, with Kevin behind him. Kevin then lifted Fedor in the air, jumped, and slammed Fedor directly into the mat on the back of his head, and one of the most unbelievable suplex body slams you will ever see. Elizabeth was sitting at ringside. Fedor's people were sitting right behind us, you know, because they always sat us all together. All the friends and family were always together. And if you've ever experienced a fight over in Japan, unlike anything here, you could hear a pin drop during a match. There's no noise. There's cheering when something big happens. But the respect that Japanese fans have for that fight, for, for that sport, is phenomenal. I remember watching that slam. We thought Fedor was dead. People at ringside thought Fedor was dead. People at home thought Fedor was dead. But Fedor wasn't dead. In fact, he reversed Kevin and submitted him with a Kimura lock less than a minute later. Even in a loss, Kevin had shocked the world with what was one of the most incredible body slams in the sport's history. Whenever Fedor is discussed as being among the best fighters ever, one of the first things that gets mentioned is the way he was able to survive what would became known as the Randall Plex. Losing to Fedor after such an amazing performance had to have been a hard pill to swallow, but Kevin didn't let it get him down. He and Fedor spoke backstage afterward and shared their admiration for one another, a practice both men had done in the past with their opponents. Fedor later invited Kevin to train with him in Russia, a request that Kevin respectfully declined. Kevin had a strong loyalty to his mentor and one of his closest friends, Mark Holman. Mark had groomed Kevin into a national champion wrestler in college and had been his primary trainer throughout most of his mixed martial art career. Mark and Kevin were like brothers and loved each other dearly. They also had their disagreements, which often played out in dramatic fashion. Wes Sims shared a story with us over lunch. It was a sushi place, I think. But we're sitting there, and Mark goes, what do you know about cutting weight? Oh my God, Kevin gets up. You motherfucker! Fuck you! He walks out and leaves. That happened several times. Things like this didn't fester for long, though. Neither of them were the types to hold grudges toward one another. Rico Rodriguez shared a quality Elizabeth had that made her such an important person in Kevin's life when it came to him getting upset. What was amazing about their relationship was she knew how to calm him down and bring him back. You know, Kevin reminded me a lot of the whole. You know, if you got him to the green, you're not stopping him. You're, you got to get out of the room. He would, he, there's no talking to him. And Elizabeth was the woman that would calm him down to bring him back to Kevin. There were times when Elizabeth had to get her own claws out. Mark Coleman recalls a time when things got pretty interesting after one of Kevin's pride fights. At 6 a.m., they call us in. He's getting paid a large sum of money. But he punched a hole in the wall. <laughs> In Japan, which, you know, I wasn't surprised, but in Japan, it's a bad thing, and they wanted to keep a big percentage of his paycheck. Uh, no, Liz, Elizabeth stepped in and took over. She's super nice, but trust me, she can really get pissed off. In late 2004, after doing a long-distance relationship for about eight months, Kevin was ready to move out to Las Vegas to live with Elizabeth, who owned her own house there. But in recent weeks... Elizabeth had noticed that something was wrong. Kevin seemed depressed and had appeared to be struggling, so she bought a plane ticket to visit him. She arrived at his apartment around midnight. So I get to his house, and I see his car there, and I knew that you could get in through the window because he had told me a story about that he had to break in, right? So I'm calling his phone. It's going right to voicemail. So I'm like, I'm knocking on the door. He's not answering. So I'm like, what do I do here? So I'm like, all right, fuck it, I'll go for it, right? And I climb on his Mercedes, I take a garbage pail, I use the hood of his Mercedes and a garbage pail, 
and I climbed through his window. <laughs> so I skinny as I was, I'm still a six foot two woman, you know, trying to fit through this little tiny kitchen window. So I wasn't exactly <laughs> silent. <laughs> So I literally have half of my body over his kitchen sink in his window and he flicks the kitchen light on and I just said, hi, baby. I just wanted to make sure you were okay. (laughs) Kevin moved out to Las Vegas to live with Elizabeth shortly thereafter. Elizabeth didn't know it at the time, but Kevin actually thought someone was breaking into his apartment and was waiting for the intruder with a gun. Fortunately, he realized it was Elizabeth and put the gun away before she noticed. Once Kevin got to Las Vegas... The notion of training with Mark was unrealistic. This is because they were now living thousands of miles apart. Kevin needed a place to train. Fortunately, Las Vegas is one of the burgeoning hubs of mixed martial arts, so he had a few options to choose from. Kevin decided to look up his old friend, a former opponent, Randy Kasor. Running a gym has its pros and cons. One of those cons being having to deal with certain athletes who are less unpleasant to work with. But that was never an issue with Kevin, as Randy explains. You know, I never had that concern with Kevin. He was there every day, ready to go, wanted, you know, wanted to learn, always trying to get better, and great partner. His wrestling background kicked in, and he was happy to be part of the team, recognize the level of guys we had training on that mat, and that that was a good place for him. As Kevin's career wore on, his physical ailments began to take their toll. One of the vicious cycles that many fighters fall into later in their careers is being offered too much money to persist and taking fights when they aren't healthy enough to compete like they're used to. There were fights he took on short notice, fights he took while he was injured, times when, for one reason or another, he shouldn't have been fighting. With the pressure to perform, the pressure to provide, and the desire to fight back and go out on top was too much for him to resist, and as his career came to an end, he ended up winning only three of his last 14 fights. Retirement can be one of the most challenging times in the life of a professional athlete. When you've dedicated your whole life to a craft and a determination to become the best in the world at something, it's almost impossible to just turn that switch off. It is common for an athlete to oversee their welcome in a sport, and for a mixed martial artist, the consequences can be devastating. Kevin struggled adjusting after his retirement, as Elizabeth explains. He was lost. He felt worthless. And I remember every day, like, you know, like when he would be really down, he's like, you're amazing. Because I, I remember sat, sitting on my knees, at his knees, going, just because you're not making the money now, baby, for me, it doesn't matter. We're going to find something for you. You have a gift with people. You light up the room. All we got to do is get you healthy. The emotional emptiness of retirement wasn't Kevin's only concern, though. The years of competition had taken their toll on Kevin's body. Infections, joint problems, a deteriorating hip that resulted in a hip replacement, and other issues weighed on him. And while dealing with these ailments, Kevin and Elizabeth were incurring heavy medical expenses. Elizabeth had established herself as a successful interior designer and small business owner, but they still had some financial hardships. It's easy to assume fighting took the greatest toll on Kevin's body, but Mark Coleman had an interesting take on some of Kevin's issues. Your body takes a beating in wrestling, and, and fighting is it's a very close second, but you know, you're more concerned about your head than you know, getting your neck, your shoulder, your knee, your leg, your hip. Wrestling was brutal. As challenging as it was for Kevin and Elizabeth during this time, these were still some of the best times of their lives. They were happy, they were in love, they got married, and they welcomed a son into this world, Santino. One of the pitfalls of being a professional athlete is the amount of time that goes into becoming one of the best in the world at something. Training and competition cut into the amount of time he was able to spend with his kids when they were younger. Kevin had always done his best to be a great father, and now he'd have time to spend with Santino and catch up on time lost with his other children, Calvin, Jasmine, and Madeline as well. Kevin and Elizabeth got a dog named Black that also kept them occupied, especially when he got into mischief, as Boss Rutten explains. This is the story. He was doing something in the backyard, ruining the backyard, and, and she opens the door and she shouts at the dog, Get your black ass in here right now! And the, I, I think there was one of the neighbors that had to massage Kevin or something, and they didn't show. Something happened because the people thought that she was shouting that to Kevin instead of the dog. So they got a big laugh out of it because they said, oh man, Kevin, you, you really got, uh, she was screaming at you. And she said, I'm never screaming at him. She said, no, no, we heard you. said, that's the dog. His name is Black. We call him Black Ass. Regardless of any hardships he may have experienced at times, Kevin always did what he could to help people. He went out of his way to help those in need, as Eric Smith explains. 
we'd see a bum and you know, like most people give a bum like a dollar or two dollars. Kevin would give him whatever he had in his pocket. And this happened like, I don't know, 40, 50 times. This isn't a one-time thing. We met Kevin at UFC 30. After the show, he was mingling with fans, talking with them about his move to light heavyweight. I asked him how he felt he matched up against the guy who just defended his belt, Tito Ortiz. Needless to say, he was pretty confident. What surprised me was how cordial and candid he was to me. It was as if he was another one of my friends catching the fights. My buddies and I were about to leave to continue our night in the casino when I asked, Hey monster, we're about to hit the tables. You want to join us? First round's on me. He said, No thanks man. I'd rather give that money to Tito's charity. I was blown away. And it's honestly a moment I'll never forget. Here's a guy who just got done telling me what he would do to Tito in a fight. Selling the fight in a way only the monster can. To suddenly flip the script and tell some college kids to do the right thing. It was unreal to me, and a reason why I'm such a fan of his. Kevin had always demonstrated a love for working with children as well. While he was at Ohio State, he participated in youth wrestling programs with fellow teammates and coach Russ Ellickson. He, he was a dynamic guy. People loved to be around. You know, when we were in wrestling camps, kids just loved him. He was so effervescent and so bubbly and so enthusiastic about wrestling and life that it was a contagious thing. Kevin created the Monster Wrestling Academy in conjunction with Coronado High School in Nevada, alongside coach Scott Kimball. This was Kevin's way of sharing the sport that changed his life with others. He was the kind of guy who went out of his way to inspire people, and this was another example of it. Rico Rodriguez experienced Kevin's inspiration numerous times, but there was one memory that stood out among many. I remember one time I was so scared to fight, and, 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 and I was nervous behind stage, and Kevin just grabbed my face and gave me the big kiss and says, listen to me. You're a world champion. No matter what happens out there, you've already done everything. And I and I never forget the calmness before entering that bout. How relaxed I was just from his like lifting me up with those words and that compassion. And he didn't have to do that. Kevin's earnestness and candid personality also made him a perfect mentor for young people. In January of 2016. He was hired by a sports agency in San Diego looking for someone to mentor their young athletes. He was just hired by a sports agency that had just signed five NFL rookies, all of them multimillionaires with, with that first contract. And how Kevin got th thought up is we knew someone that worked at the agency. And ironically enough, the owner of the agency had met Kevin at one of those seminars we did in San Diego for the military years before. So the concept was the, the owner was like, we need, we need an athlete that can come in that these kids will respect. And Carrie Mendoza was like, what about Kevin Randleman? I just happened to talk to my good friend, Kevin Randleman the other day, and he's finally healthy. He, he got his new hip. He's hundred percent cleared for the doctor to get physical again. He's looking for work. And the owner was like the monster, the MMA guy. Kevin got on the phone with the owner and they were like, all right, we're having this big Super Bowl party. All of our new athletes are going to be there. Come on down. Elizabeth and Santino had come down with the virus just before Kevin left. Elizabeth called Kevin a day or two later, but he wasn't picking up. And Kevin always picked up when Elizabeth called. He may not have always picked up when other people called, like Mark and Wes shared, but he always picked up when Elizabeth called. When Elizabeth finally got a hold of him, she knew he was terribly sick. She told him to go to the hospital for treatment. She then spoke to a doctor later that morning at the hospital, who told her that Kevin was in rough shape, but his condition had stabilized. Kevin's condition worsened over the next couple of hours, leading to him being intubated as part of his treatment. Elizabeth and her son went to an ear, nose, throat specialist she knew for their own treatment. She was sitting in the waiting room with Santino, waiting to see Dr. Sue when her phone rang. Sitting in Dr. Sue's office, Santino's right, sitting right next to me, and I see the San Diego cell phone number come up. And I answered the phone because I didn't realize he was intubated at this time. All the doctor told me was that they had him stable and that he was going to be okay at 10. So fast forward two hours and I see the San Diego phone number come up and I answer the phone. Hey, baby, how you feeling? And there's a guy on the other line stuttering and he's like, Mrs. Randleman. And I'm like, yeah, now you got to remember I'm in a crowded, tiny little waiting room in an ear, nose and throat doctor with my four and a half year old son sitting right next to me. And he goes, this is Dr. Wu. And I said, oh, Doc, how's, how's, my, how's my man doing? And he stutters a little, and he's like, Mrs. Randleman, I'm so sorry. And I said, 
what do you mean? And he's like, he didn't make it. And I'm like, he didn't make what? Like, it was like such a denial because he had the flu. Like, like, how did he die? Like, like that wasn't an option for me in my mind. And I was like, I was like, and I obviously had to ask questions. And I went up to the window and I knocked on the window and the nurse opened up and I said, I said, I need you to go tell Dr. Sue to go call my sister. She's like, what? I said, I have to walk outside. I said, my husband is in San Diego and he just died. Can you please watch my son? I have to go outside and take this call. And she's like, are you saying Kevin just died? I'm like, please go tell Dr. Sue to call my family. Kevin just died, but I need you to watch my son. And I remember going outside and my whole body was trembling. And I said, Doc, what do you mean he died? You just told me two hours ago that he was going to be okay. She's like, he's like, Mrs. Randleman, I, I don't know what went wrong. We, we, we tried to resuscitate him for, for like 30 minutes. She's, he's, he's like, I, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, nothing makes sense. Nothing made sense. Kevin Christopher Randleman died after suffering heart failure caused by complications from pneumonia on February 11th, 2016 at the age of 45. News of Kevin's death sent shockwaves through the wrestling and mixed martial arts worlds. How could one of the greatest athletes in college in wrestling and mixed martial arts die at the age of 45 from pneumonia? How could this man who had so many times left us in awe be gone and die of something that, on the surface, seemed quite treatable? When I first heard of his death, the first thing I thought of was the way he looked at me when we met in Atlantic City almost exactly 15 years earlier. How this man, who was one of my heroes, looked to me like I was his hero, even though we didn't even know each other. How he, in a matter of 10 to 15 minutes, helped pull me into a sport that I've never wanted to get away from. Randy Couture wrote a poem in the wake of Kevin's death titled, The One and Only Monster. He shared it with us. It goes as follows. You are the one monster. No one ever ran away from. It was you we couldn't wait to see. Even children searched closets, and under beds in hope of catching, a glimpse, a smile, maybe even a monster hug. You are the one monster, the unhuntable wild thing, that roamed this world and climbed its highest peaks. You did it all with a gleam in your eye that showed us all the way to travel through the darkness. You are the one monster we hold goodbyes on our tongues for, and the world believes you've departed. But we stare into the dark forest of our hearts, and it's there we find your light. We will carry it there forever. The light of the one and only monster. The news hit everyone hard. Mark Coleman describes his feelings immediately after getting the news. It's mainly emptiness. My best friend. One of the questions we asked at the beginning was, what is a person's legacy? Boss Rutten was very clear on what he thinks part of Kevin's legacy should be. Well, I hope they're going to talk about that he's inducting this to the UFC Hall of Fame because I really want him to be in there also, and everybody wants to. So hopefully the UFC is going to wake up and, and, and realize what an incredible specimen this guy was. And, and then just the stories for him, he will keep these stories to himself. But now he's away. I think we should tell these stories like the kid that he just saved. And, uh, and I want people to know what a really great guy he is so that everybody knows, you know, that he's not the animal that you see in the, in the fight. But he's just a, a very compassionate guy. A couple of years ago, Ziffa promised Elizabeth that Kevin was going to get into the UFC Hall of Fame. Ziffa has since sold the UFC, but the issue still remains. Kevin, a former UFC heavyweight champion, a former Pride superstar, won and lost some of the biggest fights in the sport's history, and most importantly, a great ambassador for the sport, deserves to be in the UFC Hall of Fame. Not only for what he did in competition, but for what he did for people while representing the sport of mixed martial arts. Kevin continues to inspire people to this day. His sister Erica shares a story about a wrestling tournament she attended that was held in his honor. They had a memorial wrestling tournament the first time last year in Vegas, and I flew out for it because I was like, I want to be there. There were so many amazing kids that came up to me and gave me a hug just because I'm Kevin's sister. But then they told me that they're wrestling because of Kevin or they're, um, you know, they, I think he just wanted to make a difference. And the thing about it is 
he did make a difference in these kids. These little kids were out there wrestling. They were battling, and they were winning. All I kept looking up, and I just kept thinking, Kevin is on that mat with those kids. He is inspiring them to this day, inspiring those little kids. Kevin's legacy doesn't just live on the children he inspired through the Monster Wrestling Academy. A fan named Brad Allen shared with us that Kevin helped him battle through obesity, depression, and other emotional issues many years ago. When Kevin was sick, with what they believed was a kidney problem, Brad even offered to give Kevin one of his kidneys as a way to pay him back for what he did. One of the most amazing stories we heard during our journey through Kevin's life came from a young man named Marcus, who had been dealing with depression and was considering taking his own life. He shared his story with us. Like, I had this, like, just this thought, like, where it's like, I should just really just end my life. So I put, I went on to Twitter, like, this is the end of the ropes and stuff like that. Like, I can't take life anymore. Goodbye and stuff like that. And I was really going to do it. I went somewhere, found rope, wherever my dad's, like, shed was and stuff. I get a notification on Twitter. It was from Kevin Randleman. I think it was on the, like, the private messenger or something. And he was just like, hey, are you okay? Like, what's going on? I just kind of flat out just said, I'm just about to kill myself and stuff like that. And he was just like, what's your number? And I gave it to him. And so like about two minutes later, I get a call from like a withheld number, like a, you know, a number that I can't like trace. He was just like, hello, is this Marcus? And like, it was Kevin. I just broke the fuck down, you know? Like, I mean, I mean, you sit there and like one minute you're about to just like kick the ro- kick the chair from out from under you. And the next second you're talking to the monster himself. He just talked to me a lot about, like, what happened in his childhood and everything like that. And and about 20 minutes goes by, and, you know, I told him I wanted to make a change for myself. And he was just like, well, you have to, you know, you have to do something about it. I don't want you to just get off this phone and then not do nothing about it, like, do something about it. And I thanked him, and um, I went and got into counseling. I had never talked about, like, when I was molested and stuff like that when I was younger, and if Kevin didn't talk to me about it, I wouldn't have faced that issue. But, you know, without Kevin Randleman calling me and stuff like that, I'd probably be dead in the ground. In closing, we'll revert back to a few of our initial questions. When a loved one passes, we sometimes ask ourselves, what is life worth? What is their legacy? What's their life what they want it to be? Kevin was one of the first people in mixed martial arts who brought true world-class athleticism to the sport. He helped pioneer wrestling as an effective fighting style and laid the groundwork for many fighters to follow. If you look at top fighters today and champions from the past, you'll see that nearly all of them either have a background in wrestling or train in it to become better. The success of wrestling in mixed martial arts is part of Kevin's legacy. Kevin's legacy reaches far beyond competition as well. There are children who pursued wrestling and athletics after being inspired by him. Friends who he helped gain more confidence in themselves, and people who actually credit him with saving their lives. When Ross Hellickson was asked about how Kevin impacted his life and what he'll take away from their experiences together, he was very clear on his feelings. I think of Kevin many times, you know, I, and you know, of course the phrase keep on believing comes up all the time, but he was a very positive thing, and I'll, in the relationship that we have will be something that will stick with me, will be one of the Final thoughts I have as a human being when I leave this earth. Kevin Randleman was a joy. Kevin's life was, in many ways, all that we could hope for in a life. His life was all it could have been, and even more. Like what you just heard? Check us out on Twitter and Instagram, at MMA TrueFan. You can also find us on Facebook and YouTube. Please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. Special thanks to Elizabeth Randleman, Erica Randleman, Mark Coleman, Eric Smith, Wes Sims, Russ Hellickson, Rico Rodriguez, Boss Rutten, Randy Couture, George Pardos, Brandon Allen, and Marcus Sewell. Additional thanks to MMA Roasted and MMA Inside the Cage. Music by With Lions Productions, artwork by Mike Zant.